Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome into another episode of the Format Podcast. All right. Normally, we do these on Saturday nights at 7 p.m., and I wasn't planning on doing one, but um, uh, then, you know, I'm, watch- I'm watching these college football games, mainly the Texas and the Georgia, and I'm like, man, I got to get on and do this show, man. I got to get the people what they want. So here we are. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate you. And um, what we're going to do now, we're going to give a few minutes and uh, see if we get some people in the chat. Then we're going to go ahead and uh, and uh, get it started because i uh, got some good topics to discuss. It's just going to be me tonight. Um, the other guys on the team, they're not, they're not here tonight. So uh, I'm going to do this solo, and uh, hopefully I will do this with whoever decides to uh, join me, and we'll see what we got going on because, again, I think we got some really interesting topics. And uh, as you can see by the thumbnail, we're going to talk some Victor Weminyama and some really interesting top uh, comments that he made recently that I think may have something to do in terms of being reflective about the state of the modern NBA. Then we're going to talk about uh, Tim Hardaway Sr., a uh, Hall of Famer who's who was an outstanding player and kind of an innovator in certain ways. And we'll get to him and some comments that he had on uh, the recent uh, appearance on the All the Smoke podcast with uh, Matt Barnes and Steven Jackson. Then we'll talk about Kyle Shanahan and ask the big question, is he overrated? And finally, we will uh, close out by wrapping up some uh, college football. And I'm not going to get too into that because, as you know, we normally do a show with uh, our uh, former Division One wide receiver, kick returner, and professional, uh, Ryan. So um, we will do that later this week. But I definitely wanted to touch on some of the big uh, – some of my thoughts in college football before we call it a night. All right? So uh, before we get going with all that, you know what time it is. If you're here on YouTube and you haven't already, please make sure you go ahead, click that like, that subscribe, that notification bell. Make sure you're kept up to date whenever we drop new content on the channel. If you want the audio only version of the podcast, open up your audio podcast platform, hit the search bar, type in the format podcast, and we should come right up. If you're enjoying the content, make sure you give us that like, that five star review, and drop a comment. All that stuff helps us rise in the algorithm, helps us find more sports fans, helps more sports fans find us. And finally, Make sure you write it down, put it in your phone, set an alarm, do whatever you got to do to remember. Saturday nights at 7 p.m., we are live here on the Format Podcast, and we'll give you the opportunity to call in, talk to us, get at me. I love it. I can't. Victor Wembenyama, why was this an interesting topic to me? So we know Victor Wembenyama was the number one overall pick in the NBA draft last year. This is a guy who everyone said was generational. You had American reporters literally going over to France to watch him Uh, to watch him train and watch him play and to interview him before he even got drafted because everyone was just saying like, he's the next guy. He's a, he's a unicorn. He's an alien. They are using all these terms to just say that he's like something we've never seen before. Victor Wembanyama is seven feet four, a pretty slim dude. So definitely not the body type of the traditional back in the day centers, but he's more like um, if you look at the way he plays, his skill set is kind of like a taller Kevin Durant. He's, you know, long, lean. He could put the ball on the floor. He can shoot the three. Not at a super high percentage, but I'm sure that'll come. He's got the range to shoot the three. Uh, he can shoot the, the the step back jumper. He can shoot the mid range. He's an outstanding defender. Great rim protector, shot blocker. So he's got that over KD. But again, he's about four inches taller. Has tremendous wingspan. Just an all around unusually gifted player, especially at that size. Now. I think a big part of that is, again, the modern NBA. He's got the modern NBA body type. He plays more of the modern NBA game. The floor is spread. So at 7'4", he can put it on on the ground. He can can dribble it from the three-point line all the way to the rim. But realistically, with his stride and his reach, it doesn't take him that long to reach the rim from the top of the circle. But the point is, he's able to do all of those things. And we've pretty much never seen a guy like that before, unless you go back to like a Ralph Sampson, who I believe was 7'2 or 7'3. And he possessed a lot of those skills, but he was way before his time. He came into the league, I want to say, in 81 or 82, and he was playing for the Rockets. But at that time, they weren't letting centers do those things. Obviously, they were allowing him to defend the paint and block shots and all those things, but they weren't allowing him to shoot the three or, you know, lead the break or dribble and all that stuff. It was at that time, if you're a center, a quote-unquote big man, you in, in the half court, you go down to the block, you get in position, you put your hand up, and hopefully you have a point guard that can get you the ball on a post-entry pass, which is almost a lost art nowadays. You you rarely see that. Most point guards in the modern NBA can't do that, either can't or won't, but I think a lot of times they're coached not to. The analytics say that the back-to-the-basket post-up is one of the worst shots in basketball right there with the mid-range jumper. So 
that's not something that you see very often. But back then, it was a staple of basketball. If you had a big, and most teams had a big, but if you had one that was worth its salt, the main thing was in the half court, get down there, get on the block, try to get an easy shot. And to, to my thinking, the easiest shot would be that, get, you know, get on the low block, get the ball and score, right? Because what? You're closer to the basket. But now they'll tell you that the open corner three is the easiest shot, which, again, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an analytics guy, any of that. The percentages will probably tell you that. But again, these guys, they train more to shoot that shot. But it would seem to me that the closer shot is always going to be the better shot. But so be it. Anyway, that's not when Minyama's game. He doesn't he doesn't play it that way. But he ended up getting picked uh, number one overall. He comes to the league. He does damage. I mean, if you could, I actually um, I didn't uh, prep. I didn't prep uh, highlights of, of Wemby this time, but that's something you can easily go and uh, look up. And, you know, he, he's a very special player if you look at him. And he is a guy, he won Rookie of the Year and probably could have won Defensive Player of the Year as well. He led the league in block shots, and he was just, you know, an outstanding player. And then he went back during the offseason. He played for his team in France in the summer, and you saw what he was uh, what he was able to do there. I think France got the silver in the Olympics, almost beat the United States, if not for Steph Curry pulling out some some miracles, right? And uh, what is this last season? Wembenyama, I think, averaged what uh, twenty one and a half and ten point six rebounds, and so he he was doing his thing, right? Very, again, very talented guy, the the type of guy he basically lived up to the hype and we saw him do just incredible things now 3.7 turnovers he definitely can work on that but hopefully that's something that's going to get better with time but also uh, one would assume like the more you have the ball it's going to be situations where that's going to happen and also when you're a big and you're seven four and you're dribbling that much a guard can easily get their hand in there and take the ball from you which is one of the reasons back in the day coaches didn't like bigs dribbling that much but anyway so Victor is all of this, right? He's all that in a bag of chips or whatever expression you want to use. He's that guy. So he comes to the league. And quick note, one of the things I like about Victor, um, even in France, once he kind of knew and got the vibe that he was that guy and he would likely end up playing in the NBA one day, being a high draft pick and all that, I think when he was like 14 or 15, he made a concerted effort to learn English. And he speaks it very well, doesn't have a particularly uh, pronounced French accent. So when he speaks English, it's very, very clear, you know, just good overall. And so um, he's been interviewed recently. He's been interviewed a lot. And this was kind of the reason that I decided to pick up on this topic and talk about it. So he was interviewed, I think, for Sports Illustrated maybe last week or the week before. And these were the comments that really got my attention. So check this out and then we'll come back and talk about it. In a good and bad way, it's how truly like the, the best of the game are. How in a good way, some of them are really like impressive and like inspiring in the way they approach the game every night. But others that I used to like and now it's, I'm just like, nah, I'm not sure that they deserve. Like they don't seem like they put as work as much work as I. Th so all right, in in case you didn't get that, what he was saying was because the music was pretty loud in the background. I wasn't able to remove that, but what he was saying, he was kind of asked about his, his thoughts on players that he used to look up to and the players in the NBA. And he was saying, you know, there's a lot of great players here, et cetera, et cetera. But he was, he's kind of surprised because a lot of players that he used to look up to once he got here, he's looking at him and he's like, he doesn't feel like a lot of them work as hard as they should. And he's like, really, this is it. And so he was surprised by that. And that really, that really took me aback because if you remember at the beginning of this thing, I said that uh, when Binyama's comments were interesting because maybe just maybe they were reflective and said something about the state of the modern NBA. So if you know me and you know this channel, I'm one of those people that's always complaining about the state of the modern NBA in terms of the narrative that today's players are so much more skilled. I just finished talking about how point guards can't make a post entry pass how many um, there are many bigs who can't go to the block, raise their hand, get the ball and go over each shoulder, maybe make a jump hook, do a step through uh, an, uh, an up and under uh, turnaround jump shot. They don't have the post game. Right. So it's not necessarily today's players are more skilled in that aspect is that they've traded one skill for another. Right. Because you have younger fans and uh, proponents of the modern NBA who are going to tell you, well, today's big men are way more skilled because they can shoot the three. Okay, that's cool, 
but can they just can they do what I just talked about in terms of going to the block and being a guy you can go to and get a basket? And I say no because that that's great that they can shoot the three, but what have they done? They've traded the post game for the three. So now if you take them back in the day where they weren't allowed to shoot threes and they'd have to go to the block and do the work, they wouldn't be able to do that. So really, are they more skilled or did they just trade one skill for another? Then you look at the guards, right? The guards are supposed to be so much more skilled. They got so much more of a bag. Their handles are so great. And I've talked about this on other episodes, but we know for a fact that the rules were changed, right? Zero step, gather step. These things never existed before. What do those do? They allow the guards more space to get off their shots, the guards and the wings to get off their shots on those step back and sidestep um, jump shots, threes and all that. It allows them to travel, but to have more, more space to be able to do that. And that doesn't mean you're more skilled. That means you're being allowed to do things. Laker Nation, what's good? What's good? I see you. I see you. Um, yeah, it doesn't mean you're more skilled. It just gives you it gives you the allowance to do things which are against the rules, right? We watch these guys dribble, these guys that are supposedly have so much better handles, but almost all of them turn over the ball constantly, walk with the ball in their hands like a loaf of bread. That's called a carry, right? In some instances, it's called a double dribble or a discontinuation. So we see all that, but guess what? The officials have pretty much been instructed not to call that because if they had to call it every time, the game would stop every five seconds. Like uh, my guy, Jason Tatum, that's a guy that's constantly carrying the basketball, right? It doesn't matter that I'm a Celtics fan and he, he's um, he's one of the best players on the modern Celtics. No, he, he carries the ball all the time. Luka Doncic carries the ball all the time. All the best ball handlers in the modern NBA carry the basketball all the time. So this narrative that today's players are so much more skilled, it's a false narrative. They just do different things, right? Um, yes, most players uh, can shoot the three ball better today than they can back in the day. Then, excuse me, than they could back in the day. But that's just a proponent of the way the game is played and the way they're coached and the way they are expected to take more shots. They practice more threes, so the three-point percentage on the whole is higher. But it's really not as much higher as you would think. I believe the league average for three-point shots is like 35%. Uh, when Michael Jordan was playing in the mid-90s, I want to say the league average was like 33.5%. So for all these extra threes they're taking, the percentage is really not that much higher more skilled though, right? It's just a narrative. Anyway, the reason I bring all this up, we talk about how skilled the league is and, and how great everybody is and all that, right? But you look at a guy like Wembenyama and the European players, their goal generally, if they're among the best players in Europe or really good players in Europe, what's their goal? To get over here and to play in the NBA. And most of them most of them will tell you is because they believe this is where the best competition is. Although I've heard some people say that the actual competition is better in Europe. I don't know. I've obviously never played on that level, so I'm not going to speak to that. But um, I've heard that said. But really, to me, I think the, the the goal for coming over and playing in the NBA is the money. <laughs> the money in the NBA is bigger than pretty much anywhere else in the world, right? So you're getting the NBA money. That's huge. But that's cool if you say it, it's the competition or whatever. That's fine. But, you know, Wemby was the best player in Europe when he was there. Uh, Luca was the best player in Europe when he was there. Jokic was one of the better players in Europe when he was there. Um, Greek freak, he wasn't, uh, but he came over here and made himself into something. But the point is, that's really interesting because so many, not so many, but I've heard multiple European players, Jokic, Giannis, and uh, Luca, and I actually did a show on this a while back, they all said that it's easier to score in uh, here in the NBA than it is in Europe. That should tell you something. That should tell you something about the rules. That should tell you something about the way the game is played, right? But, you know, everyone's going to tell, oh, well, there's so much more skilled here. But anyway, so Wembenyama, he's coming over from Europe, Wemby, and I'm sure he has the mindset of these are the greatest players in the world. They got all these skills. They can do this and that. I'm going to get over there, and I'm going to play against all these guys I looked up to. Cool. But you heard Wemby on the clip saying, you know, when I came over here, I was like, what? This is it? A lot of the guys I look up to, they don't work that hard. And realistically, it's probably true. I say it all the time, and it's unfortunate. I don't want to hate on any of these cats getting their money, right? But the money is so big now, in my estimation, there's much less of a desire to actually be great, right? Um, Laker Nation, let me... Laker Nation says back in the day they could shoot the three. And Laker Nation is referring to when I was talking about the big shooting threes. David Robinson, prime example. The game was played different. Absolutely. 
those guys could shoot the three. Um, David Robinson, he was a guard when he was younger, so that's true. And it's funny that you bring that up, Laker Nation, because I remember hearing Kenny Anderson talking about the great Hakeem Olajuwon, who everybody knows by now is my favorite player of all time. But they heard him. Uh, I heard Kenny Anderson telling the story, and he's like, Dream would just knock down threes in practice. And he asked him, Dream, why don't you shoot these in a game? And Dream is like, why would I shoot these in a game? You know, like, I'm a center. Like, <laughs> that's not what I do. And so, anyway, the point is, you know, we had bigs that could shoot them. Obviously, Rashid Wallace was kind of the one that really made it in vogue for 6'11", 7-foot guys to really be shooting threes. And then, of course, Dirk came along and then so on and so forth. But if you go back, um, Sam Perkins could shoot the three. Uh, Rick Smith could shoot the three. I mean, but that's just not the way the game was played. So, anyway, when Binyama comes over here and based on his comments, he's been disappointed. He's been disappointed by what he saw. And I guess my question would be, who was he talking about when he's talking about some of the guys he looked up to don't work hard enough? And he was surprised and he was like, this is it. And um, I I'm really curious. And so um, I know a lot of people can say, hey, oh, man, Bruce, you just a hater. But I really feel like LeBron is one of those guys because we've seen LeBron work tirelessly on his body so that he would be able to stand up to the rigors of playing all these seasons and still being able to play at a high level. And he has done that tremendously, but I don't feel like he's worked on his game. I could be wrong, but I don't feel like he's worked on his game because his offensive skill set, his toolkit has not really expanded very much in the 22 years he's been in the league. And so uh, could Wemby have been talking about LeBron? Maybe, maybe he could have. Um, what about Joel Embiid? Joel Embiid has a uh, tremendous skill set for a big man. Uh, he, he plays the game differently than modern bigs. I guess he, he'll he shoot the three, but he also shoots a ton of mid-range shots. He's deadly in the mid-range, and he's got a really great post game, which frustrates me because he doesn't play in the post enough. He could completely dominate if he played in the post a lot, but I think the reason why he doesn't want to do that is because it's easier sometimes and takes less energy to come down and just shoot a three instead of going down there, fighting for position and banging with guys' paws to get um, position on the low block and then play in the post, right? That is really tiring energy consuming and it would maybe cause him to have to work out even more in the offseason get in the gym more get the cardio right as well as get the strength right and maybe he doesn't want to do that so because i've said time and time again watching him play and i like him beat a lot i like his game because again hakeem is my favorite player and he's as close as you're going to get to dream in the modern nba and so i watch Jokic, and so many times i'm watching i'm like why are you shooting the three? You're just bailing the defense out. When one, you could get the defense in foul trouble. And and two, nobody in this league can guard you when you get going. He's averaged over 30 a game in the last three seasons, 30 and 11. He's been the MVP, but he can't stay healthy. So um, maybe when Minyama's looking and saying he doesn't work hard enough on his conditioning and on his strength, and that's why he has these problems. Like, I, I really don't know. I think that there's a Ben Simmons might be a guy that when Benyam is talking about, right? Ben Simmons doesn't seem to be remotely concerned about working on his game. And to me, that is so freaking sad because that's a guy that has all the physical tools, but it's my personal belief that he loves what basketball can do for him. He doesn't love the game of basketball, right? Because he hasn't even attempted to become a better basketball player. And again, problematic for me. You have all those tools, you're 6'10", 6'11", you can handle the ball. You can rebound when you want to. You can defend, but you just don't want to be out there. But you want to be collecting checks, though. And I don't have a whole lot of respect for that um, when it comes to Ben Simmons. Again, I come from a different time and a different era. I'm 46 years old. And so when you when you come from that era, it's just like the people from my dad's era would say that we are not as strong or as determined or as driven as they are. And that's probably true. And we would say that about my son's era. Right. So. I think each era gets less, uh, I guess they get successively weaker than the ones before because less is demanded of them physically and mentally, right? You don't have to be as physically or mentally durable in the modern era as you had to in my era when I was coming up. Same way I didn't have to be as physically and mentally durable as my dad did and his father and so on and so forth, right? And so I look at that and I'm just saying there are in every generation different kind of guys, throwbacks like your Mikes and your Kobe's that were just built and wired differently, your birds, your magics, your Isaiah's, right? Just built and wired differently. Now on the whole, back then guys were tougher. On the whole, 
back then guys were more competitive and they were more driven and they they had a greater desire to be great. And I think also part of that is the money wasn't nearly the same. And so there wasn't this gigantic pot of money like there is now. And so for guys to really get paid, they had to go out and earn it. And so it's like the guys prior to them. And so anyway, I'm just thinking like, who could Wemby have been talking about? And we'll never know because he didn't say names and I'm, I'm sure he never will publicly. But I think Embiid could be one of those guys. I think Ben Simmons could be one of those guys. I think LeBron could be one of those guys. Uh, MB, uh, Wemby also, he did he did give shout outs to um, Rudy Gobert and Kevin Durant. Now, I'm sure that for whatever reason, and I've talked about this, there's a lot of Rudy Gobert hate. And I've tried to explain why it is that it seems like Rudy Gobert is an overrated defender. It's just that they're using him improperly. And so that's going to be what it's going to be, though. People see that. Luca put Rudy Gobert in the blender and they're like, oh, he's a sorry defender, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to get into that breakdown again. I think I talked about it uh, maybe the last episode we did with Transforming these guys. But anyway, um, yeah, he spoke about Gobert. And I think the reason that he looks up to Gobert and the work Gobert puts in is because he's obviously known Gobert since he was a lot younger than both being French and both being involved with the, the national basketball program, et cetera. Uh, Laker Nation says... I know who he isn't talking about, Kyrie Irving, Russell Westbrook, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry. Those guys work tirelessly on their games. He definitely gave uh, big ups to Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant does work tirelessly on his game. To me, the only knock on Kevin Durant, I don't think he's – I'm concerned about his mental fortitude. I don't know that he's the most mentally strong guy, and clearly he's not a leader. Now, everybody's not a leader, and he came out and said that he's not a leader, so – I guess we have to take that with a grain of salt, right? Everybody's not going to be a leader. Everybody can't be a Mike. Everybody can't be a Kobe. Sneed, what's good? My brother, Salam. Salam, good to see you here. Um, Yeah, everybody can't be a Mike. Everybody can't be a Kobe. That's a different type of wiring and a different type of mindset. So if KD is not a leader, then so be it. He told you he's not. He just wants to go out there and hoop. I don't even know if winning is all that important to KD, right? He just seems to want to go out there and hoop and hand people to work. And so be it. But um, that the, that was one of the people that um, when Binyama really shouted out in terms of guys who work hard and, and develop themselves was Rudy Gobert and Kevin uh, Durant. And again, I I don't think that a lot of people are going to be like, well, why would he why would he shout out Rudy Gobert again? Because he sees the work that Rudy Gobert puts in, and he understands that um, he's seen it for years because Rudy Gobert is his teammate on the national team. Um, Transformer, what up, bro? Uh, he says, I highly doubt he's referring to the 40 year old guy has no, he has no idea what Bron has done the years prior. I think it's more pointed at the other bigs who have been in the league longer. Maybe so. Maybe so. Um, I'm not mad at that. I don't know if you heard Transformer when I was saying why I think it could be LeBron. I'm not speculating that it is. I'm saying for me personally, LeBron, as we know, works tirelessly on his body. I'll just reiterate real quick, tirelessly on his body to be able to handle the physical strain of playing at a high level for so long, totally get it. But it appears to me that he has not worked on his game because his actual game hasn't uh, expanded that much for all the time that he's been in the league. He still pretty much plays the same way. Uh, but, you know, that that's my thought. So, yeah, so when Binyama, I just thought it was so interesting that he – made it a point to say that there were guys in the league that he was surprised they didn't work as hard as he thought. And he's like, well, that's it. And, you know, but he also shouted out some other guys. So, you know, that's me. He says, um, Laker Nation says here, I think he's mainly referring to American players. Yeah, I think so too. And okay. So as you mentioned that we see that the NBA is going heavily to international markets, right? Why? because the American market is saturated. Obviously, they want to get their hands on those uh, international dollars or uh, euro or pounds or whatever it is, you know, yuan and yuan and, and uh, uh, yen and what, what, whatever whatever the currency is in, in that local market. They want all of it. And I, and I get that. It's a business, right? And so by bringing in uh, players from all over the world, you will get their, their local followings, and that means you will get more of the money coming in internationally. Totally get that. But at the same time, with those players that come in from overseas, those players seem much more hungry. They seem ready to come in and ball and to prove themselves. And I don't know where this sense of American entitlement came from, but it's really hurting the game and in terms of the game itself and the American players, because we constantly hear like, who's the next great white American player or even who's the next great American player, period. Because again, and I've talked about this as well, you look at the, um, 
the uh, all uh, was it the all NBA first team. And I believe Jason Tatum's the only American on it. Right. It's uh, so what do you got? Um, either Embiid or Jokic this year was Jokic. Right. So uh, who was it? Let me see. 2024. Uh, give me a second. Let me find that for you. 20. 2023, I guess, was last year. NBA uh, 2023, all, all NBA first team. Let's see who's on there. I think there's only one American, though. Uh, da, da, da. All right, let's look. Let's look. And it is. All right, come on. Show me, show me, show me. Okay, so all NBA first team last year was Giannis. Luca, Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Jokic, and Tatum. When have we seen that before? Granted, it's a more international league, but only one American on the All NBA first team. And that's probably not going to change because um what's his name? Uh Wemby might he might end up all on 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 the all NBA first team this year. The dude is serious. Um Transformer, what's good, brother? Much near rest tonight. Had a lot of events. Catch up with you tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah, definitely Transformer. Um, I wasn't going to do this. And then uh, Bruce was like, yo, you know, a lot of good games today, man. Yo, you got to do the show. So I'm like, you know what? Let's get it. And I just decided I'm going to go ahead and do it. So I'm rocking and rolling. But yeah, so um, Wemby's comments were really interesting. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to open up the phone lines. And let me put it in the chat for you all. So you definitely can call in uh, 904-219-8264. 904-219-8264. It's also running on the bottom of the screen. So I would love to hear from any of you who want to call in. Give me your thoughts on uh, on uh, Wembenyama and his comments about uh, NBA players and him being kind of disappointed because they don't work as hard as he expected. It doesn't really disappoint me. It's To me, that was kind of to be expected. But I guess he thought being in the best league in the world with the best quote-unquote players in the world that he would see more of that. Um, while we are waiting, please, if you haven't already and you're here in the chat, make sure you hit that like and subscribe for me and hit that share button, man. Um, let's see. Laker Nation, what did you say? Tired of the Jason Tatum hate. The kid is a champion. MVP caliber player, just very young and still developing. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And again, I keep saying it three years in a row, all NBA first team. Like that doesn't happen if you're a bum. I can't. I can't figure out the Tatum hate. I think it's because, and G talked about this, it's because he's always invoking Kobe's name, which he shouldn't because he doesn't play anything like him and he doesn't have the requisite aggression to be a killer. So people look at him and they say, okay, he's light-skinned and his game is super smooth and he's calm and he's now here screaming and yelling and he's not he's not super aggressive, so he must be a bum. And I'm like, yeah, that that doesn't make any sense. But that, you know, th those are my thoughts. And Real quick with that whole light skin piece, that's that's just stupid. And, you know, I'm not even no, nah, I'm not even going to do it. It's just stupid. It's just stupid. As black people, we got to stop that. But anyway, um, yeah, so those are uh, my thoughts. So uh, doesn't look like we're going to get any calls on this Wemby topic. But, yeah, I thought I thought it was uh, I just thought it was interesting. And I thought. I really would have loved it if he would have named names and call guys out. That would have, he would have really been a dog if he did that. But, you know, I guess it's supposed to be a brotherhood and a fraternity in the league. So you don't want to completely disrespect people and alienate yourself among all these players, especially when you're super young. Cause what happens if for whatever reason you don't uh, decide to, or San Antonio decides to move you at some point, right? I, I don't see it happening, but what happens then? Like, you don't want to be in a situation where you've alienated yourself with multiple teams and multiple players around the league and nobody wants to, uh, be your teammate. So, you know, that's that. 